Hello, friends. Miss Ray here. Mr. Hadley here. So we wanted to do kind of a little bit of an overview discussion conversation about this concept of the American dream that you're tackling this week with that academic paragraph that we've assigned you. So to kind of start off, I think we want to give you just kind of our definition of what that means to us. And just to give you a preview, like this isn't going to be entirely lecture based. You're also going to watch just some conversation between Mr. Hadley and myself. Um, as we kind of navigate this topic, we'll be speaking on the American dream and the Horatio Alger myth as well. So we just kind of want to give you an overview as well as, as well as a few insights and how we might see it displayed in the text to help activate your thinking as you approach that paragraph. All right, so the American dream, Hadley, do you want to start us off with a definition of what does that mean to you? Uh, so when I think about the American dream and like, I remember first encountering it probably freshman year of high school, probably with Of Mice and Men also. Um, and it was this like idea that America is a place where as long as you work hard and you do good, um, you can be successful in whatever that means. I, I remember as a teenager, I definitely was very much of the mind that that was like, that meant financially that like if you worked hard, you'd move your way up. Um, and I think that's how I saw it because it's what I saw from my grandfather, uh, both my grandfathers who were like, they worked hard and they moved their way up the ranks. And like, that's just the way that it's supposed to be. And that's, I think what I always thought of with the American dream was like hard work. Um, and the result is success financially. It's the owning a house and the white picket fence and all of that kind of stuff. So that was my, that's kind of where, where I came at it from as a, as a teenager. What about you? I agree. I think also for me, the first time I was introduced to it was when I was in high school reading literature that really addressed this topic. Um, and it did start with Of Mice and Men. Um, and just really noticing that this idea of not only hard work, but also like having good morals and good values, all of those things eventually pay off in the end. And it doesn't matter where you started, you're always able to get yourself up there um, if you believe in yourself and if you work hard, then you can achieve kind of whatever you want. Um, and I think it's important to also note that that includes um, social mobility also, that we're not just discussing um, financially being successful, but also being successful as far as like a social caste and a social order goes. Um, so I think that speaks specifically when we look at like Curly's wife, for example, who, um, you know, as the wife of the boss's daughter or wife of the boss's son, She's not necessarily in a terrible financial situation. However, as a woman with zero opportunities um, given to her in that time, we see kind of that social mobility becoming apparent in her dream. She wants yeah. to be known. She wants to be valued. She wants to be, be in pictures, as she says. Yeah, I think uh, you, when you brought up the like morals and values, I think that's sometimes a thing that gets lost in that discussion. Um, and that really is part of it. I mean, that's, and in the social mobility, like I, my dad and grandfather, I had to learn how to properly shake hands with both of them for like hours. Like it was like a full on lesson and it wasn't for any other reason than because this is going to help you move up in the social hierarchy, especially at like church for me, that was the big thing is like that handshake. Now, of course it feels so weird to be talking about handshakes but like, <laughs> that like a whole idea of not just hard work but upstanding moral value and like the kind of moving up the social hierarchy I think that that's a I think that's a point that gets neglected when we talk about the American dream a lot is that is that the good moral standing whatever that means also mm -hmm. yeah I agree this idea of like your character will lead to your success it's really like who you are and how you carry yourself and the things that you learn and the things that you do and the things you do for others, all of that's going to lead to that, that success. And that's the American dream. And it's something that um, it, it's been kind of driven into our society so much so that it affects the way the rest of the world views us. Like there are many countries um, where the belief is like America is this haven and it's this place where you can come for opportunity and you can get anything you want here. And that it's so much a piece of many immigrant stories that bring people to the United States is this idea that things are better here and 
the opportunity exists. And if I go, when I work hard and I try hard, I will be successful. And of course, there are those stories out there. I don't want to negate that. They do, of course, exist. But I think the issue is when it becomes the dominant narrative, that that is the reality, when for many, um, it's perhaps not. Yeah, well, and I also think that one of the issues I've always had with the American dream is it kind of, it neglects how much help it takes to do a lot of that stuff, that it's not just about your own ability to work hard, because I, I'm not going to lie to you, my father has not taken a sick day in his entire career, where, and he's worked for the same company for as long as I've been born. Um, he could legitimately, we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, he could legitimately not go to work for five months in a row and get paid for all five of those months because he has that much sick time saved up. If hard work was all that was required of things like that, my dad would be running um, O'Reilly's or it was, you know, Cragen for a while. And like, um, it does require other things and, and, and knowing people and all of that. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that we don't highlight when we talk about the American dream. Um, and I don't know if it's just a product of, because it's like the ethos of America to be a place where people can come to and we don't want to like puncture any of that ethos. Um, but it is something that has to be discussed when we talk about what it means to have upward mobility in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how you get access to those things that you need. Some people are granted access at birth, right? Some people need to earn it. Some people have things working against them where um, neither of those is possible. Yeah. So that kind of brings us into this second idea, which is the Horatio Alger myth. Um, and Hadley, we were snapping about this back and forth this morning. Um, but the kind of overview of the Horatio Alger myth. So Horatio Alger was an author um, who wrote books that were primarily for young men. And the whole idea was it was like this like street urchin type character, this like down on their luck, bummer of a kid who works really hard and does good and shows good character. And as a result, they have all of this great success by the end of the book. There are all these like feel good stories of like, yes, even if you're down on your luck, this is what you can do to then get so much better and to achieve success in America. Um, and so he wrote a series of these texts, which is why um, this myth is based around Horatio Alger himself. Do you have anything to add about the, the author, Mr. Hadley? Um, well, so, and it was all in a really short amount of time too. Like he was popping books out for a very short amount of time and it was a good couple years. Um, and when they, I learned this, I learned a couple things today about Horatio Alger. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about all of them, yeah. but one of the things I learned is as they, as he kind of fell out of favor, his publishers suggested he go West to go to California and like try to update his model of storytelling. And he was so hung up on his exact method of storytelling that all he did was just change all of the locations to California. The story stayed exactly the same. And he, so he, he stopped selling because yeah. of it, because it, people wanted, people stopped wanting that story. They wanted like fanciful adventures. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other things are one, he uh, was accused when he was a minister of molesting boys. And he never, he was never uh, really charged or anything, but he didn't deny it. Um, and there's a lot of belief that that's why he started writing these books, was to like atone for those sins. And it turns out that a lot of the newspapers and publishing companies that published his, published his stories edited, that, edited them. So they took out the moralistic part of it and also took out like, so one of the things that all of his protagonists had was they all did a really good deed. They were all of high moral standing and usually they were rewarded by that. So for example, a, a character would find like a bag of money. One of the kids would find a bag of money instead of keeping it, he would go return it to the owner. And then the owner would be a wise old man who would give him a reward. And publishers used to cut that stuff out to make it look like it really was just the like hard work 
was the was the good stuff there and that's how that myth became propagated mm -hmm. yeah so the reason we call it the Horatio Alger myth um, is that this idea and kind of what the what that theory states is that this idea that American dream that you do hard work you do good and you succeed and your story ends happily ever after um, is in fact a myth is that it's it's not true it's not real and that this is something that instead we're led to believe um, and some might even argue is used as a tool um, to help to keep people um, happy with what they're given because they think, oh, well, if I just stay with where I am now but work really hard, then of course I move to the next level. Um, so that's kind of where that myth aspect comes into it. Yeah, well, and it also, it doesn't address gender or race in any way at all. Like all of this, all of the protagonists in his stories are white kids. They're all white boys, mm -hmm. right? They're all white boys. Um, even he had some, I know he talked a little bit about how he didn't think he could write these stories from the perspective of non-white boys because it wouldn't work. And so when we think about the myth, we do like, there is a, an aspect of, you know, and you, you talked about it being born into a certain social standing. Like even there is a certain amount of privilege that comes with like, you know, these little white boys can maneuver their way up the social ladder with a lot more ease than even a, a white girl could or a person of color could. Mm -hmm. And we, it gets neglected a lot. And even in the stories where we are talking about the American dream, like a lot of the classic works of literature that talk about the American dream don't address that as well as they could. Mm -hmm. And we see that a little bit in Of Mice and Men in that we get, I mean, we get to meet one character of color and one woman. Um, but in both of those cases, right, Crooks, for example, is just as hard of a worker, is just as valuable. Some could even argue more valuable and a better worker than so many who are on that farm. But we see the, the position that he lands in regardless in that space. However, yeah. when we meet that, um, oh, I think it's, I don't remember the name of the, the character who wrote the, um, published letter to the editor, right? This is someone who's finally yeah, yeah. seen and like, oh my gosh, look at him. Like he's achieving it. He's doing it. He's doing it just because someone um, published his work and was willing to listen to him. So we see kind of these, these two different perspectives of how that might play out for our yeah. characters in Of Mice and Men. Well, and like if hard work was all that was required, Lenny would be so much more successful than anybody else. Right, like, exactly. Yeah you know, but he's got a mental illness, which is another thing that gets often neglected when we talk about stories like this. And then we see Curly, who on all accounts is just kind of a jerk, right? And doesn't treat people well. However, he still is successful because of his position. He's the boss's son, right? He comes from a place that's different. And it's important to note that that position, because also the son of a farm owner is crooks right? Yeah. We learn about the farm that he grew up on. However, that difference when it comes to the disparity in what was given and made available to people of different races, we know that regardless of Crooks also having a landowning father, it's not going to make a difference for him in the way that it does for Curly. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And I, I it's funny because as I was reading stuff about the Horatio Alger myth, there was a lot of stuff about how I first learned about the Horatio Alger myth in like middle school or high school. And I, my teachers didn't touch on it in even high school. Like I, it wasn't until I, when I was reading The Great Gatsby, which y'all will read in two years. Um, when I read The Great Gatsby for the first time in AP lit and I started doing my own, like, cause you know, I fell in love with the book from page one and started doing all my own research that I stumbled upon American Dream and Horatio Alger myth. It's something that, while we still talk about the American Dream all the time, I don't know that the Horatio Alger myth is still something that gets talked about in a significant way, or maybe that was just my experience, I don't know. It's possible. And that's also one of those things where like how much of what we are taught depends on where we are as well because like growing up in the east bay and at a high school in the east bay like that was part of the narrative when we talked about these pieces of literature and when we read so many of the things that um like i know our classes are going to be reading some poems from langston hughes next week um, and they'll see kind of that same idea brought up and then in future years when reading great gatsby like you said or a raisin in the sun it's something that was um 
I guess depending on the instructor, but not hidden from us when it came to those conversations. So I think it's important that we we address it with with our students. Yeah, and I think those ninth grade students who are planning to take honors ten, if the summer book is still their eyes are watching God, there's a lot of the the black experience in trying to achieve the American dream in that book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really interesting topic, a commonly recurring motif throughout um, literature, specifically American literature um, and poetry and song, et cetera. Yeah. Especially American literature from the 1800s till about the 1930s, 1940s, mm -hmm. um, before like modernism and postmodernism take over. But like that whole lost generation of writers, it's what they're all lamenting. Every single one of them from the early 1900s to the 1930s, it's... It's just one one long lamentation on the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think I pretty much hit most of the stuff that I wanted to hit. Um, obviously, students, if you need any help or want further discussions, we'll we'll be holding various Zoom discussions or discussions on different platforms um, throughout this week as you continue to kind of really dig deeper into that text and pay attention as you're doing that close read like as you're looking at the parallels and the contrast and the irony like where that where that over overarching motif of the american dream and the attainable or unattainable nature of dreams um pops up as you can yeah, yeah. And I, think, I think mr landis is doing um something with irony and that's a really big uh thing for you to as miss ray just pointed out a big thing for you to kind of track as you go back in through a close read of, of Mice and Men is the way irony is being um, weaponized to talk about what the American dream means uh, specifically to that era and for these poor farm workers in California. Yeah, those who traveled because they felt like this is where it was better. All right, thanks so much friends for watching. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and take on the American dream and the Horatio Alger myth. We miss you. Miss you.